I wanted to uh, give a talk using these Jupyter notebooks. I, I've been lecturing with Jupyter notebooks like this in my numerical courses um, at, at Northern uh, Illinois University. And, um, and, and I, I like these, I like using these notebooks because it allows you to, you know, easily uh, have the, the mathematics all typed up here. And also you can have uh, code and you can run the code and, and see the output. And you can very easily just try new things during class. And so if anyone has any questions or they want me to try something different, maybe change a parameter and try that and see what happens, then uh, just go ahead and you know let me know. I have the chat window here open. So you can type there or you can uh, turn on your microphone and, uh, and uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Um, and also, uh, if you're interested, uh, this uh, Jupyter notebook is available at this uh, GitHub uh, site here. So you can go to uh, my GitHub uh, and it's the noisy sensor network repository. You can download this notebook and all the code. Uh, so this is a, a, a joint work um, that we did um, a, a number of years ago um, with uh, Dima, Viriz, and Henry. We, we worked on this, this paper on noisy Euclidean distance uh, realization. And this paper had these uh, two different approaches. There is this robust spatial reduction approach that uh, used these um, exposing vectors in order to um, intersect the, the different faces uh, in order to reduce the problem down to something uh, small and easy to solve. And this sort of worked on sort of smaller, denser problems. Um, and then there's this other approach that we had using the Pareto frontier. And I, I've never actually given a talk on this uh, second aspect of this paper before. So I thought this would be a, a good opportunity to sort of revisit this paper. Um, all the code that we wrote for this paper was in MATLAB. And so I've kind of come back at it and uh, tried to re-implement things in Julia and, um, and and just just see just see where it takes us. So I thought this would be sort of an interesting thing to to look at. Um, okay. So I've already run this code, but I'm I'm just going to run it again in order to get everything loaded. Um, I have most of the code is in this second file here, uh, functions.jl. Um, so there's there's a number of functions in here. Uh, so if you're if you're interested, uh, you'll be able to see that easily at the GitHub repo. Okay, so um, so we're, I'm going to take like a Euclidean distance matrix approach to the problem of sensor network localization. Uh, so we we want to find uh, positions p1 up to p n that satisfy uh, certain given distances, but also the last M uh, sensor locations are, are given. And these are what are called anchors. So P1 up to P N minus M are sensor positions and, and the remaining are anchor positions. But notice that I'm explicitly sort of, uh, you know, assigning uh, variables to the, to the anchors, because later on I'll I'll treat them as as variables, um, as you'll see. Um, and and by the way, whenever I use the norm, it's the Euclidean two norm. And E is the set of edges in a graph, a G. So I'm not going to talk too much about this graph G, but um, in the literature, it's also uh, often this problem is referred to as uh, graph realization because you're trying to um, or embed the graph in some uh, 
uh, our dimensional space. Okay, so just to get a, a picture of what this looks like. So here I'm um, generating a problem. It gives me the uh, random sensor locations and also the uh, random anchor locations. And I put everything into this matrix called P-true. And then I compute the, uh, the distances from those positions. Um, and I, I say two, two of them are connected if they're within a certain radio range. And in this case, I'm using 0 0.3. Uh, we have 50 sensors and anchors um, and five, so five of them are anchors. So there's 45 sensors, five anchors, and we're in two dimensions. So this is what uh, an example sensor network might look like. Uh, we have the five anchors here that are sort of uh, spread apart. Uh, it just happens to be that, that way for this example um, because they're randomly placed. And then the remaining ones, these uh, circles are sensors. And wherever there's uh, an edge connecting two points in this graph, that means that we have uh, measured that distance. And in this case, in particular, these measurements are going to be noisy, um, uh, sometimes very noisy. So we're, we're going to consider a, a fairly large amount of noise, as we'll see later. Um, OK. All right. So, so that, that's the picture. Um, so let, let's go through a few more definitions here. So we're going to take a Euclidean distance matrix approach to this. So we're going to consider the, uh, the distance matrix D uh, that is uh, whose entries are the, the uh, distance squared between PI and PJ. And the um, embedding dimension of a Euclidean distance matrix is the smallest. Uh, oh, this should be actually uh, R. <clears throat> so it's the smallest R such that uh, this condition holds. And E n is the set of all n by n Euclidean distance matrices. Um, so the connection to semi-definite programming, we're going to be using semi-definite programming to solve this problem. Um, so what we can do is we can uh, take those points that um, give us this distance matrix D, and we can consider the uh, corresponding gram matrix. It's the matrix of all the inner products of, the, of these uh, PI and PJ. So X is going to be a, a semi-definite matrix. And the entries of the distance matrix are linear combinations of the entries of the gram matrix, uh, specifically this linear combination. So I'm going to refer to this um, linear map uh, as k of x. Uh, and it's not too uh, hard to see based on this that if I do k of any semi-definite matrix that will give me a Euclidean distance matrix. And any Euclidean distance matrix can be um, uh, obtained as K of some positive semi-definite matrix. So this is a, a really wonderful uh, relationship here. It means that if we have a problem involving semi, uh, Euclidean distance matrices, we can uh, represent it using semi-definite matrices. And so we, we have all the uh, power of semi-definite programming that is at our hands now in order to handle these problems. Um, throughout, uh, E will be the vector of all ones. And this linear map K is a uh, bijection between the centered semi-definite matrices and the uh, Euclidean distance matrices. So it's the it's a set of matrices X that are positive semi-definite. And uh, X times the vector of ones 
is zero. So E is in the null space of the matrix X. Okay. And I, I just noticed that um, being in the in the US for a while, I'm starting to spell words using the American spelling. So um, okay. So uh, another really wonderful relationship is that we can actually determine the embedding dimension of a distance matrix by uh, the, the rank of the corresponding gram matrix. Okay, so that's an important idea. Uh, one other linear map that we'll be using throughout is this map, which we call P. And P is simply going to um, take the uh, P of a, a matrix, a symmetric matrix will take the IJ entry of this uh, matrix. So it sort of extracts uh, the IJ entries uh, for each edge from the matrix and puts it into a vector. And that vector is in uh, RE. Uh, the vector D is going to be the vector of square distances. So this D is not the original distances, but it's the distances uh, squared. And now we can uh, write our sensor network localization problem uh, in the following way. So we want to get the um, minimum rank or minimum embedding dimension. Um, such that it satisfies the distance constraints and X is a centered positive semi-definite matrix. Uh, so once we solve this problem, then we can factor X as P times P transpose, where P is an N by R matrix, R is the rank of X, and the, the rows of P are going to give us the positions of the points. Um, and finally, what we'll do, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, is we, we then use the anchor positions to align these, uh, the points in this matrix P um, by solving a Procrustes problem. And that, that's where the anchor positions come into play. But before that, we don't actually um, include the anchor positions explicitly in this uh, Euclidean distance matrix problem. Okay, so now on to the noise. So I'm going to say D are the noiseless square distances and D bar are going to be the noisy square distances. And the, the noise model that I'm using here is a multiplicative noise model. So there's this P that appears here that's sort of like a percentage error so we could have 10% error, so P would be 0 0.1, for example. Um, and the epsilon ij is a normally distributed uh, variable with mean 0 and standard deviation 1. Uh, so this uh, factor that I'm multiplying the distances by, this is going to be um, a normally distributed variable with mean one and standard deviation is P. So, um, so if P is 0.1, then this could be, you know, 1.1, uh, for example, or uh, 0 0.9. So it could be plus or minus 10%, uh, you know, that's the one standard deviation. So, you know, 67% of the time it'll be within that range, or it could um, go out to two standard deviations. So this could add a significant amount of noise. Um, so I'm sort of thinking about adding this noise here to the distances, and that's why I'm squaring it. Um, there is a little bit of a concern when P is large that this, this number here could actually be negative and then um, it doesn't make uh, as much sense, but we just kind of go with it and um, see, what, see what happens. 
The one thing to notice is that if you sort of expand this out and rearrange a little bit, you'll see that um, this um, sort of relative measure of the error is going to be approximately 2p times epsilon ij. Uh, so we expect that this relative um, error will have mean zero and uh, standard deviation 2p. Uh, so just to get a, a, a feel for this noise, I have this function called noise stat, and it returns um, the error and standard deviation um, from generating a, a large number of these d bar vectors, and then just looking at uh, the errors and the standard deviations. And I created a couple of histograms here. And also you notice that I'm uh, reporting the, the mean of the errors and the mean of the standard deviations. So as we see the, the mean of the standard deviation um, is, uh, is approximately uh, 2p. Um, uh, so I'm, uh, so it's the standard deviation of this, of this vector, right? so, so as you can see, um, we expect the standard deviation to be 2p. And so, um, that's, that's what we, we observe here, but, um, a little bit more mysterious is, um, what is the, the mean of the error? And it looks like it's about a 0.34 for this example. Um, and I, I, I spent a little bit of time trying to figure out maybe some sort of a closed form formula for, you know, what is this error? Uh, what, what, what should this error be? Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't too successful. So uh, instead, I, I just have this, this function, which will, uh, given a value p, will report what these uh, sort of mean error is um, using this noise stats function. So here's a um, here's a plot of what this function looks like, uh, p versus the the mean error, and it almost looks like a, a straight line, but it's not quite straight. And if if I went out further than you know zero point five, you would see that it's sort of curving up so it's it's definitely not linear it's like quadratic or maybe a higher degree uh, something I'm, I'm not exactly sure um, I'm sure there must be some way to um, be more formal about this but this is this is what I, I did okay and this is kind of important because we'll see um, the reason why I'm focusing so much on this mean error because in order to uh, use this uh, technique that we're going to be talking about, um, if, if an engineer was uh, wanting to use this computational approach, they would need to have some way to estimate um, uh, or put a bound on the, the error that they would expect. Right? Because so we're, what we're interested in is what is the sort of maximum likelihood um estimator for the the noisy distances that we've measured and so we're sort of looking for a solution that has uh, a, an, an error that's somewhere uh, around the mean of the of all the possible errors okay so here I'm just generating a, a single instance of, of the noise. So now finally, this is just a single vector of noise. And I thought in order to uh, visualize it, it, it'd be nice to just do another histogram of the, the noiseless distances and the noisy distances. So you can see you know, how the distribution of the distances for this instance has sort of uh, changed. Um, you, you see how the, the radio range is cutting off the noiseless distances here at um, 0 0.3. Um, but because of the noise, we're getting uh, measured distances that are actually larger than this radio range. Um, but we, 
we, we use them as they are. We don't, we don't toss them out. Um, okay. And, and here for this specific instance uh, of noisy distances, this is the, this is the, uh, the norm of the, of the, uh, the error between the noisy distances and the true distances. So there's that number again around 0 0.34, 0 0.35. Um, so that's sort of our goal. That's, that's what we would like to have a, a solution that's uh, approximately um, this level of noise. So that's our, that's our tolerance on the noise. Okay. So um, as, as we saw above, in order to get the solution that we want, we are interested in finding an X with minimal rank so that we get a solution that's in the lowest possible uh, dimension. Um, often these, uh, these graphs may not be rigid and so they'll admit solutions even without noise, they'll admit solutions in higher dimensions. If the graph is really rigid and there's no noise, then um, you'll, you'll just sort of automatically get the minimum rank uh, just by uh, the fact that that's the only feasible solution. But if there's some flexibility, then when you solve this semi-definite problem, you're going to get solutions that are in a higher dimension, which, which is something that we have to deal with. So we would like to have a way to encourage the rank of this X to be as low as possible. Um, minim minimizing the rank is, is a difficult problem. So common convex uh, relaxation for rank minimization is to minimize the nuclear norm, uh, which is the sum of the singular values. But since X is positive semi-definite, the nuclear norm is the sum of the eigenvalues of x because the eigenvalues are equal to the singular values. And the sum of the eigenvalues is the trace of the matrix x. Uh, also, since x is centered, the, the trace of x can actually be shown to be equal to the sum of all of the um, pairwise uh, distances uh, squared. Um, so if we take this um, nuclear norm minimization approach, that corresponds to minimizing the trace of X. Um, another approach that has uh, come up in the literature and sensor network localization is to maximize the trace. And the reason is because as, as we can see from this uh, equation here, minimizing the trace, uh, it can be seen as pulling the sensors uh, close together, whereas uh, maximizing the trace will push the sensors away from each other. And the, the idea with this maximum trace is that uh, it should cause the graph to sort of flatten out and give us a, a low rank. So we'll um, experiment with that. Okay, so just to recall what the sort of the goal um, value for, you know, what, what should this sigma be? We have to make a decision about that. So according to this um, sort of um, simulation, uh, we expect it should be around 0.34. So I'm gonna take something that's maybe a little bit larger, kind of round it up. So we'll use 0.4, and then we'll solve both the uh, minimum trace uh, problem and the maximum trace problem. So this opt trace function, it's over here, and um, it is using a package called uh, jump. And also, uh, so that's the modeling package. It's a Julia mathematical modeling package. And then SES is the solver for solving the semi-definite um, relaxation. And it looks like um, it looks like this. So I I define my uh, positive semi-definite matrix X, 
And then I'm going to either maximize the trace or minimize the trace. And um, here is the, um, the way that we can write this norm of the uh, error uh, is bounded above by this error tolerance. So we, we write it using a second order cone constraint. And then here's the centering constraint. And then we optimize it and we re return the optimal solution. So back here, I now have an optimal uh, x for the minimization problem, uh, minimum trace, and one for the maximum trace. Now, and then I compute the corresponding uh, distances uh, here. And I show what, the, what, their, what their norm is. But as we can see, in, in both cases, for minimum trace and maximum trace, that noise constraint, that second order cone constraint, is active. Um, but something interesting happens when you look at the, the error compared to the, the true distances. Uh, in this case, we actually see that the maximum trace is giving us a smaller error. Um, okay, so uh, after we get our optimal x, um, maybe I can show you uh, this. We'll look at the, um, the eigenvalues of x uh, min and the eigenvalues. I could probably plot this too, but let me just sort of put them side by side. Um, so as you can as you can see, it looks like the maximum trace uh, is sort of achieving a, a lower rank. So it's I would say it's approximately you know rank four numerically, whereas the minimum trace is uh, rank six. So we're getting for the minimum trace, we're getting a solution that's in uh, six dimensions, whereas the maximum trace is giving us a solution that's in four dimensions, and then we need to round that down to two dimensions so that we can look at it. So that's where this low rank projection comes in. So we project the optimal X onto the set of rank R matrices, and then we factor it as P, P transpose to get our uh, positions. Um, and the rows are the estimated sensor and anchor positions. Okay. So I have a function called low rank solution that that does exactly that. It extracts the uh, positions of the sensors. Um, and then again, because of the rounding, I'm going to get different distances here because in the projection, it distorts uh, the distances that I, that I get from doing that projection. So I wanna look at how does the projected uh, solution um, compare to the noisy distances uh, so we get, again, the uh, maximum trace is giving us a smaller, um, a smaller error here compared to the noisy distances and also compared to the true distances as well. We see that the maximum trace is giving us um, a, a better fit. Okay. And then finally, we align the anchors. So we, uh, we have uh, anchor positions, which I call B in the matrix P, are, are likely not correct. And I, I can show you uh, this plot here. Um, so there's the uh, minimum trace solution. There's the maximum trace solution. And as you can see, the 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 anchors in this max trace solution, also in the min trace one as well, um, they're not where they should be compared to their true positions here. So we need to rotate this solution so that the anchors line up and that gives us uh, this solution here. So that's the max trace aligned where the anchors have been aligned. So how do we do that? Well, what we do is we first take those uh, those anchors B, which are these ones here in this picture. Um, and we 
we center both B and A by subtracting their mean point. And then we align B and A by solving this Procrustes problem. We get the optimal orthogonal matrix uh, that minimizes the Frobenius norm between uh, B times Q and A. And we can get the optimal uh, orthogonal matrix. Uh, it is U V transpose where um, the U and the V are coming from the singular value decomposition of B transpose A. So then we replace P with P times Q and we add back that, that mean that we subtracted over here. We have to add it back and that gives us our aligned solution. Okay. Okay, so next we want to refine the positions of our uh, of our solution. As you can see, there, um, you know, it's pretty good, but it's not as good as it it should be. This is the true solution, and you can see that definitely we're not. Um, there's a, a number of places where this is uh, not um, matching uh, this very well. So. We're going to run a, um, uh, a gradient ascent method in order to refine those positions. So ba based on the multiplicative noise model, what we would actually like to solve is this uh, least squares problem here. But th that seems to be a very ch challenging problem to solve. Um, so instead of doing this, we consider uh, a, a simpler model, which looks at this relative um, error. But since I don't know the true distances, instead of dividing by the true distance down here, I divide by the measured distance d bar. Um, so I'm going to uh, do a, a gradient ascent on this objective function here. Um, and the whole reason now for solving the semi-definite relaxation above is to get a good starting point for this gradient descent minimization. Okay. So, um, so it, here mathematically, I wrote the function as a, a function of uh, all the points, but in, in the code, I just made this function Q a function of the of just the sensors, not the anchors. And um, I wrote this, uh, this function Q. Uh, here. So there's the there's the function Q. And I, I didn't want to be bothered with computing the, the derivative by hand. So I, I used a package called zygote which uh, is an automatic differentiation package. And it does source to source translation. So it actually um, gives me a source code for evaluating the derivative. And it's quite nice too, because the input to this, to this is, a, is a matrix and it actually, the output of this will also be a matrix of the same shape. So that's this, uh, this package uh, zygote, which is a, a very popular package in the Julia community for automatic differentiation. Um, so uh, Mikael asked me about uh, why gradient descent and not Newton. Um, it's, uh, so I think there's, there's much better uh, approaches than what I'm doing here. Uh, for example, um, uh, Professor Ying Yu Yi, uh, uh, gave a talk on uh, a much, much better approaches for doing this refinement portion. Um, but I, I just wanted to take a very sort of simple approach here. Um, but yeah, now, now that I think of it, probably like doing um, uh, quasi-Newton would, would be interesting. It, it may give us um, better results. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, we, I just did a, a very simple gradient descent, um, just a, a simple line search type method. Um, so I can show you, um, 
Oh, well, let, let me let me run this first because this this can take a little bit of time. Um, but look at the refine code here. Yeah, so I, I just implemented like a very simple Armijo Goldstein backtracking line search uh, here. And then I just um, update um, like this. So just a, a very simple uh, gradient descent. And uh, it, it works. It's uh, You can see that um, the objective value is decreasing, and it also is decreasing the uh, root mean square deviation uh, uh, when compared to the true positions of the sensors. OK, so what does this uh, look like? Um, so here's the max trace aligned uh, that we had before. This is the true positions here. After running gradient descent for 100 iterations, we get um, an improvement in the picture. And if we run it for 1,000 iterations, then we get um, even more improvement. And it's a little bit hard to see how much they differ. So there's another plot here that I have that sort of shows you very clearly how much the, the sensor positions differ from their true locations. So if, if everything was correct, we would get a picture that looks like this. The SDP solution here um, has quite a bit of uh, error. Uh, and things are sort of spread out because we're doing this max trace. So that's why things are sort of spread out away from the origin. Uh, running it uh, gradient descent for 100 iterations uh, gives us a nice improvement. And then running it for 1,000 iterations gives us even more improvement in the positions. <clears throat> OK. So this, uh, this brings us to this uh, Pareto frontier approach. So that, that's all to motivate, like, what is the problem we want to solve? We want to solve this maximum trace problem uh, where we uh, specify a tolerance on the, the noise, that sigma. And um, this is uh, our approach that we took is, is very, uh, it uses the, the Pareto frontier. Uh, Pareto frontier is, uh, I, I think, probably most commonly known as the efficient frontier and portfolio optimization. So in portfolio optimization, you want an investment portfolio uh, that is <clears throat> efficient in the sense that um, there's no other portfolio with a higher expected return at the same level of risk. So the, the risk is uh, the x-axis here and the expected return is the y-axis. So at a certain uh, risk level, we want to uh, go as high as possible with the expected return. So if we're on this efficient frontier, then there's no portfolio that will give us a higher expected return for this, that level of risk. Um, and it's well known in portfolio optimization that this efficient frontier can also be parameterized the other way as well. So we can parameterize it instead of using risk as the parameter, we can use the expected return as the parameter. So we specify a level of uh, return and then we minimize the risk subject to that desired level of expected return. So we do the same thing here. We, we have a, a Pareto frontier, which are this, <clears throat> the solutions, um, <clears throat> which are uh, optimal solutions of the, the maximum trace problem. Um, and so our Pareto frontier is parameterized by this sigma. So different sigmas will give us different solutions, but we can also parameterize it by um, the trace level as well. So we can sort of flip the objective and this constraint. We can instead think of minimizing the error subject to a, a constraint on the trace. Um, the, the difficulty here is that, you know, it's, it's reasonable for us to know what the sigma should be, but it's, it's a much harder problem to know what 
the this tau should be. So what what is the what is the bound on the trace? What what should that be? And what we need to do in order to use this, we need to determine what is the value of tau that would give us the the this uh, sigma. So what uh, what what value of tau gives it, does this optim, opti, optimal value of this problem uh, give us sigma? So we need to solve this equation here. So our, the approach that we we use is um, inspired by the Pareto frontier approach used by the SPGL one solver. <clears throat> so I'm. Uh, I, I won't I won't click through this, but they they've got some sort of pictures over there um, and a related problem that they look at where they use this Pareto frontier approach. Okay. <clears throat> so here is the the function phi of tau. Uh, again, I'm using the jump. Uh, I'm using jump and Julia to. Uh, solve this minimum noise problem uh, subject to a constraint on the trace. Uh, takes a little bit of time. Um, I, I solved it 50 times for uh, 50 different values between um, A and B. And this is what uh, the efficient frontier looks like. <clears throat> so for us, the efficient frontier is, is oriented uh, this way, because we are interested in maximizing the trace and minimizing the error. And so we get this sort of shape. Um, and this uh, point here is the, is the point x max that we're interested in finding. We want to find this point on the efficient frontier, on this Pareto front frontier. But in order to do that, we need to know what uh, the value of the, the trace should be. So we know what we want for the error, but we don't know what the value of the trace uh, should be. <clears throat> okay, so maybe I'll, I'll fast forward through some of this, this math here um, and just kind of uh, give you the, the main points. The one thing I wanna point out here is that uh, we're, we're looking at minimizing this function here and its gradient is going to be uh, sparse. So the gradient of F is going to be a sparse matrix. It has the same sparsity as the original graph. So that's uh, very useful. We use a Frank Wolf algorithm for um, solving this, uh, this the sub problem. Um, uh, So here's the here's the Frank Wolf algorithm. Uh, one thing I want to uh, point out about this algorithm is that um, we don't actually explicitly store the matrix X. So there's this X here, but I never actually explicitly store X in this um, in this Frank Wolf method. Instead, what I update is the uh, the result of uh, this linear operator L on X. So that's what I keep uh, updating. Um, so here I start with an X naught that is feasible, but I don't actually store X naught, I just store L of X naught. Um, and then when I uh, choose my search direction, uh, it'll be uh, DX. So DX is going to be S minus uh, X. And I just, uh, I, I don't store S, I just store uh, L, or I don't store DX, I just store L times DX, or L of DX. Um, and in order to compute the search direction, I need to do an eigenvalue, uh, solve an eigenvalue problem on this sparse matrix um, L, S, Y. So that's the uh, L adjoint Y. Uh, so I was sort of trying two different things. I was trying to use like a Lanchos method to just compute 
the two smallest um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. But I was having some issues there. So I also uh, just switched it to like a full eigenvalue decomposition. Um, but for large scale problems, you would want to take advantage of the sparsity of this uh, matrix uh, LSY. Okay, so that's sort of like the main work that is that this method requires. It's it's this eigenvalue decomposition here, computing eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Okay, so um, so the Newton method is going to take the the uh, output of this Frank Wolf, uh, the solution of this Frank Wolf subproblem. It gets a, a lower bound and an upper bound on the, the uh, efficient frontier uh, at that level of tau. So we give it a value of tau and it will give us a lower bound and an upper bound. And it'll also give us um, an affine minorant of the, of the function. So we can use the slope of that affine minorant to do an inexact Newton Step. So just to show you what this looks like, so I gave it the this uh, value of I forget what the value of tau is exactly that we started with, but it's you know somewhere above seventeen point five, and the uh, Frank Wolf method will give us a, an upper bound and a lower bound and also this slope. That slope is actually the eigenvalue that we're computing, um, and it will give us kind of an approximate Newton method. So it'll come down here and this will give us our next value of tau. So if I run this again, you'll see that now it's using this value of tau, gets an upper and lower bound and a slope, takes us to our next point. And this will gradually sort of run a Newton method to solve the equation phi of uh, tau equals sigma and we get closer and closer um, with that. So that's that's the that's the big picture. Um, so here's the uh, inexact uh, Newton method. So um, it just runs Frank Wolf, then does the Newton step, and you know, keeps running it until the upper bound that we get from the Newton step is less or equal to this um, uh, this this upper bound that we're we're specifying here. So I'm I'm giving it like a, a lower bound and an upper bound on sigma, and I want to find a tau such that phi of tau is between is in this uh, interval between um, sigma lower bound and sigma upper bound. So here I. I give uh, an interval of uh, from 0.3 to 0.4. So I run this uh, inexact Newton method in order to uh, determine the value of tau. In fact, what it doesn't, I don't actually need tau. Uh, it, it returns this x. Uh, the x actually gets, gets built after the Newton method is done. It constructs the x. Uh, based on the eigenvectors that were computed at each step of the, the last time that the Frank Wolf method ran. Okay. So you can see the number of Frank Wolf iterations. This is the number of eigenvalue uh, calls that were made. Uh, you can see the initial value of tau, and it gives us uh, a range of values for phi of tau, and we want to keep uh, iterating until we get um, we we get an upper bound here that is less than or equal to our, our desired upper bound. And in the end, we get a value of tau here, which is like ten point seven, and you can see the the noise level is actually 0.34, which is great. And then we run our refine uh, here. But uh, so here's the uh, efficient frontier again. So this is the x that we wanted.
but we specify like an, an interval. So I want it to be between 0.3 and 0.4, and it'll keep uh, going until it gets to uh, a point uh, X, which may not be uh, exactly on the efficient frontier. Um, so it's a little bit sub uh, optimal, but uh, it, it is within that uh, desired um, interval for the noise or for the error. So this is the solution that I get from this inexact Newton, and then I refine it, and it looks like that. So this is just 300 um, iterations. Okay, so um, then I decided to try a larger problem. So instead of 50, I'm going up to 500 now. I'm not drawing the edges here because it would look terrible. So I'm just showing you the sensors and the anchors. My dog is scratching at the door. <laughs> Apologize about that. Um, oh, and by, by the way, uh, before, yeah, I'm using like 20% noise. So it's, it's a very large amount of noise um, that we're using. So here we sort of get a, an idea of what the value of stigma should be. Um, and in this case, because I, I wasn't able to like plot the efficient frontier, it would be uh, too hard to actually run that, uh, solve that SDP like so many times to get a, a plot. So what I, what I did is I, I used the Frank Wolf method with a lower bound of zero. And I just started at some value of tau and it would, it'll return, um, a range, uh, a lower bound and an upper bound. Uh, I have to sort of put it back into the original, in terms of the original problem. But I get this um, interval here, and I want it to be sort of in this interval. So that seems like maybe a good place to start. It's in this interval between um, 0.2 and 0.4, and I want it to be between 0.1 and 0.2. I'll give this a run here. Um, and then I'll, I'll just run these other things as well. So this actually uh, takes quite a bit of time. I was actually uh, pretty disappointed at this point. You know, I was sort of trying a lot of different things. I think there's more that I could do in order to get this method to be more efficient on these larger problems. I was hoping to try a problem that was very large, but um it definitely requires um more more tricks more tricks have to be uh be used here in order to get something nice but uh but there you see uh we did like 1600 um frank wolf iterations uh we get a trace of 120 and there's the error that's in this uh, in this interval, and now I'm running the uh, refinement. Um, so this took like 40 seconds, and this is going to take um, some time, and then eventually we'll get a plot here. So um, I'm going to just open the door for my dog, and I'll I'll, I'll see if uh, if you guys have any questions, let me know. Let me just scroll this on. So that there's that's that's the the final um, picture. So okay, thanks, Nathan. So um, so refinement is on the right, inexact on the left. Yeah, this is the this is the the output of the inexact Newton solver. Uh, so the Pareto uh, frontier approach. And then I ran 300 uh, iterations of gradient descent. Um, I could maybe try to run a few more. <clears throat> Let me just start it from where I left off. Is there any, I'll, uh, I'll, run, I'll run 300 more uh, iterations, see if we can get something that looks 
um, hopefully a bit better. But this is quite a bit of noise. It's like 20% noise. So yeah. maybe maybe this is reasonable. I, I, I don't know. Any questions? Yeah. Can you use for the Newton first guess, can you use the gradient descent and use both methods in a kind of interactive hybrid way? So like like all kind of alternating in a sense. Exactly, yeah. Ah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, let me let me see. I'm just gonna go up to this. So here's the uh, here's the yeah. So the the problem I was having was you know like what what should my initial tau be, and and maybe there's a way to are are, are you so are you suggesting that maybe we could use the uh, gradient descent refinement in order to uh, get an estimate of the tau. And then, um, I, I believe so. Yeah, it's well known that a good guess for Newton will help a lot. Now, here, 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 you're talking about inexact Newton. Yeah, so maybe you can help it from the side with a gradient descent. Yeah, but it's it's interesting you say that because, um, you know, at at each each time I run Frank Wolf, I do get. X sort of uh, stored in a broken apart way, but I, I only build X like at the very end, you know, after the final iteration of Frank Wolf. But I could actually build X um, each time I run Frank Wolf and then do something with X in order to help the next iteration of Frank Wolf. That's a, that's a, really, that's a really nice idea. Yeah, thank you. Really welcome. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps just talking about this. So returning back to my question, I yeah. did some experiments 10 years ago with that. And I used pure Newton on the very original non-convex problem, uh, starting from the SDP solution. And I just needed in many, in many problems, I just needed four or five uh, iterations of the Newton method to get the exact solution for noiseless problems, of course. So, and these problems are not too big for, for standard software, nonlinear programming software, to avoid uh, assembling the Hessian. So, yeah, just, just that. Yeah, so, so for, um, for Newton method, I'm just going up to the refinement part again. Um, <clears throat> uh, way up here. So was was the the Newton method that you looked at did it use a, an objective function similar to this? Yes, yes, yes. And then and then you you needed not only the 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 gradient but also the hessian. Also the hessian. Yeah. I see. Which still is not so if you have 500 uh, 500 sensors it's it's not big problem. Yeah. What about, about non-smoothness? Is there a, any worry about, about the uh, loss of smoothness? Um, well, uh, let me know. I, I didn't use exactly this function. Let me see what, what I used. Um, well, simply uh, minimizing the square distance minus the given distance squared. So everything squared. Oh, everything squared. Okay. Yeah. So square on the inside and square on the outside. There was a, a paper by, um, I think it was Beck and um, I forget the other author. And they, they specifically looked at, I think it was just this, the single location problem with a, a single sensor. Yeah. And they looked at those two different uh, uh, objectives: the squared least squares and the uh, the non-squared least squares, and they found that uh, using no squares here was actually 
better uh, numerically for them with their approach. So that's, that's why I sort of uh, went this route. Mm -hmm. But if, if using squares here allows you to use a more powerful method uh, easily and you know get better results, then um, I think that would, that would definitely be worth it. Well, you, you see the Newton, it's quadratic approximation. This is quadratic function. It, it's almost there. So it is yeah. a few iterations then. And, uh, yeah. If you start with, with that, that good solution, of course, for it, for the noisy problems, probably it, it wouldn't work. That, that, that would, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I was, I was, I just, I was, I was trying to see quickly if I, if, if this automatic differentiation package would allow me to do, um, the get the Hessian for free. So I was just, I was curious to see if that would that would work or not. Maybe not for this problem, uh, not for this objective, but for the squared one. Can I have one more question? Which <laughs> yeah, of course, please. <laughs> always bothered me a little bit more general question. It's about this RMSD measure of, of error or, or of, the, of the result. Yeah. Because it's, it's uh, okay, it's Euclidean norm, and it does not tell you a difference between a result which is almost, or everything is slightly off all the nodes, or all the nodes are almost exact, and few of them are completely off. Right. So I was thinking about measuring uh, also number of nodes which are out of epsilon circle around, around the given position. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I ended up uh, using the root mean squared uh, deviation. Um, I, I, Everybody is using that in the paper. Yeah. What has been a little bit. Yeah, like even, uh, you know, even when you just Google like root mean squared deviation, um, the, the first thing that shows up is root mean squared deviation of atomic positions. So specifically, um, you know, talking about the uh, like protein folding uh, problem, and, and this is what this is what is used. But um, yeah, so and you know, actually, ori originally when I was when I implemented this, I I just used the norm here. But then I, I thought maybe you know having sort of like an averaged error would be better. Mm. Um, but but yeah, you're you're right. Um, uh, like when you when you look at this picture, like a lot of them are you know pretty close. There's only a few like yeah. here, here, and here that are actually um, significantly worse than the others. And it may be even much worse sometimes if it sort of swaps for, for some almost symmetric um, positions. So sometimes it, it's really it should be on the left hand side and it's it's on the right hand side instead the, the computed one yeah um yeah i, I sort of, i think that that's sort of happening a little bit like in these uh areas on on the edge here mm -hmm. uh especially here um you can see that these ones are the ones that are sort of the most violated whereas the ones sort of in the middle of all these anchors are 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 sort of much better um and there was other, like when I was doing random examples here, I, I saw, I think exactly what you, you said, there's like, it should be here, but it was uh, sort of swapped yeah. where, of where it should be. Also the root mean square may be totally wrong because you aren't really trying to solve that problem. The algorithm is solving a different problem. I mean, yeah. of course, in the real world, you'd love to solve this problem, but in between this problem and the algorithm is a model. Yeah, and that's the this. Is actually yeah. trying to solve the model. So if you want to test how good the algorithm is, root mean square doesn't tell you anything. Yeah, you I threw I threw square. it in here just to sort of you know check that if I minimize this function, that the root mean square deviation also gets right. smaller, but you can see that this this objective is going down, but sometimes root mean squared is actually increasing. So, yeah. 
So your algorithm may be doing better and the root mean square will get worse. So it's really not fair to the algorithm. Yeah, like around here is like, you know, I'm getting better root mean squared here, but over here I'm getting better objective uh, values. Yeah. I have to say, I, I thought I thought this would be easier, but you know, this is a, a really challenging problem. So, um, but I uh, I really I really enjoy going through this. So, if if anyone uh, is interested in having a closer look at the code, then I, again, uh, let me put the the um, uh, the link is is here to all the code that is uh, in this presentation. So if you if you go to uh, here, then you'll see the Jupyter notebook is here. Of course, you need uh, to install Julia and uh, Jupyter notebooks in order to open this and run it. Um, and then here's all the the other functions uh, in this file here. 